chapter 8. Amen. If you would stand for the reading of God's word, Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Amen. Mark chapter 8. We all want to stand for the reading of God's word. Mark chapter 8, those that can. And I'm reading from the Amplified Version, so it may sound different than yours, but if you just follow along with me. We're going to begin at the first verse. And in those days, when again an immense, an immense crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and told them, I have pity and sympathy for the people, and my heart goes out to them. And they have been with me now three days and have nothing left to eat. And if I send them away to their homes hungry, they will be feeble through exhaustion and faint along the road. And some of them have come a long way. And his disciples replied to him, how can anyone fill and satisfy these people with loaves of bread here in this desolate and, in, in, and uninhabited region? And he asked them, how many loaves have you? They said, seven. And he commanded the multitude to recline upon the ground. And then, and he then took the seven loaves of bread and had given thanks. He broke them and have given and kept on giving them to his disciples to put before the people. And they placed them before the crowd and they had a few small fish. And when he had praised God and given thanks and asked him to bless them to their use, he ordered that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied, and they took up seven large provisions, baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And there were about 4,000 people, and he dismissed them. And at once he got into the boat with his disciples, and he went to the district of Delmanutha, or Magdala. The Pharisees came and began to argue and question him, demanding from, us, from him a sign and attesting miracles from heaven maliciously to test him. And he groaned and sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation demand a sign? Positively, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. Father, right now, hide me behind your glory. Don't let me be seen or heard, God, but let now your word be like a two-edged sword cut going and coming. Allow my mouth and my, my tongue to be as the pen of a ready writer, that you will be glorified and honored. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We have been talking um, uh, very uh, uh, um, viciously, if you would say, um, about understanding how investments and why it's important to invest and why it's important to take care of the things that the Lord has given into our hands. And if the truth be told, we all recognize that every one of us have a gift in here, right? Amen. We have something that God has invested into our lives um, that we are supposed to now make more of for him. And that's one aspect of, the, of, of, of it because a lot of times we get so caught up into um, trying to do things for him that we forget other people. Wow. Well, we, we get so caught up in making life happen for God that we forget that there are people around us that need our help. One of the worst things in the world is for a church to be only church-centered only and not family-centered. Okay? It's sad when a church can only do church, but they don't do family. That's why it's very important for us that every once in a while we give you family week that you were able to spend with your family and have time with your family because it is important to recognize that other people matter. Not just God. Amen. I, I, I would say something theologically, but I don't want to get you messed up on it because a lot of times we, miss, we misread the text of things. Um, and, but the, the scripture said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's what he said, gods, plural, right? Did not say that you can't have other gods in your life. <laughs> just means you can't have gods above him now what do you mean by that because see most of the time when we hear about gods we think about these powerful beings these great things these gods are things that are important to your life 
Okay? Y'all ain't going to talk to me. That's what he's saying. Thou shalt have no other gods. Your children are a god to you. They're important to you. But they should not be above God. Your, your family, your husband, your wife, they're gods to you. They are. They, they're something that you reverence. They're something that you love. They're something that you appreciate. But they should never come before God. Me and Cole Pastor have always made the pact, and it's not to be malicious or ugly or funny, but it's just the truth of the matter is this, is that I love her enough, but it's not, I don't love her above God. She loves me enough, but she does not love me above God. See, the problem comes in with this here when people mismanage who God is and they put people above God. So when God speaks, they can't hear God because the person that is over God now begins to speak to them and they now they don't know what to do. That's why you can't be. Gee, Paul said this, follow me as I do what? follow Christ. So he understood that there was an order to this thing. There is something that is important about us caring for other people, but not putting other people above God. Y'all, come on, talk to me. Because that's how we do. It's, it's important that you make sure your family is taken care of. It's important that you make your way, your wife is loved and your husband is appreciated. But at the, at the same time, they cannot come before God because what people will do is they will use manipulation and they will lose witchcraft over you to make you feel like if you don't do this for them, then you don't love them. How can you, why, why are you going to church tonight? Don't you love me? Why can't you stay home with me tonight? No, baby, I got to go where past where the Lord tells me to go. I'm sorry. I love you. I holler at you when I get back because nothing goes above God. Y'all hear me because it's important that you understand this thing, but you're supposed to care about people. You're supposed to be sensitive enough to the needs and the wants and the desires of people. But most of the time, we get so caught up in our own life and what's going on in our own circumstances and our own situations that we fail to realize that there are people around us that are hurting just as much. We forget that there are people around us that are going through just as much and watch this and we have the answer to their needs but because we have become so, so inward and so introverted that we're only looking at what we're going through and we cannot now even minister to a person who's struggling right next to us. Here it is in this book. You're saying, Pastor, that doesn't make sense. Well, let me take it to the book then. The book opens up like this here. Jesus now found, finds another crowd. Another crowd found, finds Jesus. Jesus and they begin to follow him for three days somebody say three days they're following him for three days and as they're following him Jesus is recognizing something Jesus is recognizing that they're dwindling in food Jesus is recognizing that their deal there that, that what they had they longer they no longer had now this is the problem that I have with this per se this is the, pla the place where the issue comes in is that these men who are 12 that walk with him for a long time that have been around him for so long could not see that there was needs among the people Okay, maybe I'll talk over here. Now, now, now I'm, this is not for leadership, but this is leadership if you want to take it that way. Because it is sad that the only person in the church that can see that there is a need is the pastor. The only person that recognized that the people were hurting was Jesus. Uh, everybody else was going on about their merry business they was having a good old time doing their thing. And the only person that felt compassion... The Bible says he felt pity and he felt compassion for them was Jesus. Isn't it sad that folks sit next to you in church and cannot even discern that you're going through? Well, y'all talk to me this morning. It is sad to be in a place where you can come to church. You've been churching with these folk for four months, for three months, for four weeks, for five years, for ten years. And still, they have no clue that you're struggling in your life. The twelve are walking around chilling. Doing their thing. And Jesus says... Hold on, y'all. These men are, they don't have anything. Their food is dwindling. Their food is gone. And so, watch this. The men who walk with Jesus, who have seen Jesus do miracles, who've seen Jesus perform stuff, who've seen Jesus act and just do things that they didn't think could ever be done, the only question that they could ask him was this, how can we satisfy them? Yeah. 
These men, now you must understand now, because this is not the first time this happened. Because the beginning of the text says, and again. So obviously, this happened the first time. Well, this happened the first time with the little boy. The little boy had the two fish and the five barley loaves. Y'all remember the text? If you don't, go home and study it. That's in, that's in uh, Matthew, I think, chapter 14, uh, or Matthew, uh, Matthew or Jude, John 6. John 6 is where it talks about the little boy. The little boy brings his lunch to Jesus. Now, watch what happens. The little boy brings his lunch to Jesus, and Jesus now breaks the bread, and he breaks the fish, and he now, watch this, he's now dealing with a bigger multitude than he has here. Because in that verse is five thousand, in this one is four. How can you not have a? How can you have a problem trusting God when it's less than it was before? Y'all better talk to me. So the Bible says, watch this. The Bible says we don't have anything. Isn't it sad, Teacher Gaither, that you have people that walk with you, that talk with you, that know how you flow, that know how you operate, and the only thing they can ask is, how can it be? Doesn't it sound like the young man last last week who said, I don't know, I, I knew you could, and I didn't understand how. See, that's what happens when you walk and you don't really flow and who people are. You begin to see people, but you don't know people. That's why you have a struggle, because if you knew who Jesus was, if you understood who he was, you are not a problem at this situation right here, because you know he's the problem solver. But the first thing they say is, how can we do this? Isn't that funny? You tell the church we're about to do a, a building project. I don't know where you're going to get the money from. How are we going to build this church? We ain't got but 50 people. How are we going to do it? The first thing that comes out of our mouth is negativity. The first thing that comes out of our mouth is anything that looks bigger than what our pocket is, we say something negative to it. Why? Because we're fearful. And anything that you fear, you will talk yourself out of. That's why most of you talked yourself out of the job. You've talked yourself out of the house. You talked yourself out of the business because it didn't line up with your pocketbook. But it doesn't matter what your pocketbook says. Y'all look at me and be like, I'm strange today. But you are so bound by your pocketbook that you forgot that there's somebody on your side that's greater than your pocketbook. You forgot that the healer and the miracle worker and the way maker is on your side, but the only thing you see is your other God. Because your past now has become greater than God. Your finances have become bigger than God. Now you're struggling. Well, you know, I mean, I I was going to do it, but you know, I thought I was going to use some wisdom right now. That's fear. You have allowed fear to talk you out of your stuff. The first thing the disciples could ask, they didn't say, Lord, we saw you do it before. So come on, do it again. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it again, Jesus. They, they, didn't, they didn't say, Jesus, I watched you. I, 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 we, we seen what you did with the little boy's lunch. <laughs> and that was just two fish and five loaves. Now you got seven. Oh, I, I see what you did over here the last time when I needed some help and how you caused provision to come in my life. So guess what? Let me trust you again over here. No! The first thing they said, how can this be? How can we do this? Now, you must understand something. Because God never asked you to do something that he does not do first. The Bible says, if you go to it in John chapter 6, if you go to that one, the Bible says the little boy with two fish, five loaves of bread, after Jesus broke them, the Bible says, and he gave. 
Okay. <laughs> See, y'all got to study your Bible to understand this. The Bible says God gave it to them. He sat the people down and God fed them. In other words, God was being the prototype for what he was expecting the disciples to do the next time. He was expecting them to mimic what he does. So if my God knows how to speak in a situation that's difficult, my job is to mimic him the next time. If my God can stand up and say peace, be still. It's my job the next time to mimic him. If my God can say lay hands on yourself and you shall recover. It's my job the next time to do the very thing, y'all. So this text comes in when you would have thought they learned something. You'd have thought they learned by now. Okay, Jesus, I just saw you do it. I just saw you take a little boy lunch with two fish and five barley loaves. I saw you took it and you multiplied it. Watch this. Jesus should have never even been involved in this one. Okay. Okay. There's no way Jesus should have had to do this one right here. Why is it, y'all, see, uh, uh, that y'all want Jesus to do everything? Every time something happens, you want Jesus to fix it. Jesus when you fix it. Jesus when you come through. Jesus when you do it. Jesus when you make a way. Jesus when you operate. Jesus when you do it. What's in your hands? What do you have in your capability to make something happen? That's what Jesus asked them. What do you have? He didn't tell them to bring it. Why, why did he ask the question? For them to come into the awareness that I have the means in my hands to make this happen. My question to you is what do you have in your hands? Listen to what they said. Oh, we got seven loaves. Jesus said, bring it to me. 4,000 people, seven loaves. Don't equate, I don't care how you put it. That's like point, point two something of a morsel. Brother Andre, point two something of a morsel will make you mad. He said, What you got in your hand? What do y'all have? We got seven barley, we got seven loaves. Jesus said, All right, bring them to me. Now watch what he does. He does the same thing. What I just say, he does the same thing. He ain't do no new tricks. <laughs> he ain't had no new gimmicks. He didn't shout backwards four times. He didn't scream, holler, and fall out. He did the same thing that he did in John. He broke it. And gave thanks. I can't, I can't even preach this no better than this. Your struggle is you trying to do five Hail Marys, four prayers, three thank you Jesus, one holler, one jump up and down on the foot, four turnarounds, one run around the church, and you expect it to happen. No, baby. The only thing you need to do is break it and give thanks. You trying to figure out a remedy and he already gave you what to do. Break it and give thanks. He used the same thing in every 
one of them. Now watch this, y'all, because you must understand that the Gospels are four occurrences that happen from different points of view. Why is it that every one of the Gospels have the same view on that? God, because that's how you get God to move. You break it and give thanks. What are you breaking? You breaking your flesh. You breaking your will. You breaking your attitude. You breaking your disposition. You breaking your wants and your habits so that he can now be glorified. Break me and give thanks. Yo. <laughs> That's why some of you ain't getting nothing because you're still in the way. Break yourself or you wreck your. See y'all old y'all ain't old school for real. Y'all ain't old, y'all ain't old school. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. That's what the song that said, break yourself for you wreck yourself. Yo. Now why is it that the secular world can understand that? But the church world can't understand that. Break yourself. You're running around here trying to get God to come because you think. You think you holy. You think you righteous. You think you wonderful. But you ain't broken. God have mercy. You still run around with a bad attitude with folk. You ain't broken. You still run around not even talking to folk. You ain't broken. You still run around thinking you better than everybody else. You ain't broken. It is the folk that when, break, when you break yourself and give thanks, God will multiply you. Okay. See? The Bible says the same thing. He gave thanks. He broke it. Right? Or he broke it and he gave thanks. He broke it and he gave thanks. Right? He gave thanks. He broke it and he gave. Listen to the principle. Y'all didn't hear the principle right there. See, the first principle, watch this. It was not for them to get. It was for them to learn. God have mercy. See, everything that God does in your life is not for you to get something. It's sometimes for you to learn something. They were trying to teach them. He was trying to teach them how to get the multiplication. Okay? The multiplication was break it, give thanks, give. But watch this, y'all. Because God said this time, I'm not going to take you out of the equation. Oh, God, this is so good. Because the first time, I didn't use the disciples. I used myself. But this time, I'm going to use you. So in other words, I'm going to break it. I'm going to give thanks for it. But then I'm going to give it back into your hands and sound figure out what you're going to do with it. But now the purpose of me giving it back into your hands is not to go buy a new Louis. It's not to go buy Versace. It's not to go buy Gucci. It's not to go buy a, a whatever Kate Spade. It's for you to give it away. Oh, the Lord bless me with a raise. <laughs> and your offer is still ten dollars. <laughs> oh, the Lord gave me a he gave me a twenty percent raise on my job, but your tie is still the same. Preach, son. Yes, sir. I will. I will. See, he was trying to get them to understand the principle. Yes. The principle that he was trying to understand, get other guy. If you give it away, if you do something with it, it will come back greater. Yes. Yes. But these guys didn't understand that. That's why they were struggling. So in other words, what God had to do now is give them instructions. Why does God have to speak to you twice? God have to say things twice to us. But then you fuss at your kid because don't, don't make me say that one more time. Come. Every mother and father in here has done it. Make me talk to you one more again. Then why Jesus got to talk to you more than once? Why he got to keep telling you get right, do right, be right. And then you're ready to beat your child after the first time, after the second time. But then you get mad when, when God start beating you. See how, you see how, you see how manipulative we are? 
He said to them, I'm going to give it to you. Watch this. Go disperse it. They take what, they, what God has broken and blessed, and he gave it to them, and they, uh, they gave it. Now, why did he do this too? This is a kingdom principle. The kingdom principle was this here. I'm transferring authority. What I did, now I'm giving you the authority to do. I'm giving you now, I'm showing the people, I'm giving in front of the people the transference of the anointing and the power. Because if it was not inside of them, it would have stayed what it was when God gave it back. But he had them to have it because now the same power lives inside of you. You just didn't know it. Now, watch this. I have to make a sign for you. For you to recognize that there's power in what you're doing. It is. He's trying to take us to the place that he is. So that he can now be. As long as we are waiting on him. Watch this, y'all. The Bible says Jesus is at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and I, right? right? That's what he's doing. He's not on the earth. He's not distributing power. He's not distributing wealth. He is not coming to your beck and call. I'm sorry, y'all. No, y'all believe that. We just do cliche things in church because that's what we're prone to do. But the Bible, the truth of the matter is that it's the Holy Spirit that lives in this place. It is the Holy Spirit that resides in us. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He's only one place. That's what the Bible says. One place. He's only one place. Jesus don't live in your heart. The Holy Spirit lives in your heart. Okay? Y'all need to understand these things. So when I understand this principle and understand what he's doing, what Jesus was trying to get them to understand was, I gotta go. I can't stay down here and keep doing for the people. That's why I got you. Catch this, catch this, catch this. Catch this, leaders. Catch this, leaders. As the apostolic anointing is arising upon our life, we can't stay in pastor role. That means that I can't sit and meet the needs of everybody on the pastor level because of the apostolic call. But I need those that are called into leadership to begin to step into the position and in the place so that when we go up, you are able now to take the position that we are. This is what happened. Jesus now gave them his position. He gave them the authority now to do exactly what he was able to do. Can I tell you, every one of us in here has the same authority to break, give thanks, and multiply. Amen. Amen. After he gave it to him, I love Jesus. Let me tell you why I love him in this text. I love him because y'all joke will say, I'll pray for you. And be going about your business. Child, the Lord going to make a way for you. I know he will. <laughs> Baby, just keep on holding and believing. Hold on. Don't give up yet. God is still able. And you know, we get a good quickening. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus saw that there was a need. Watch this. Far beyond what the disciples could see. How is it? Because Jesus made this statement. If I send them away right now, they'll die. You too quick to go home because your cake is ready to be baked. And somebody about to die on your row. You so quick to go get to the go get to go get to your 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 greens with onions in it or with to or turkey in it. Or you're so quick to go get to the fried chicken or you're so quick to go get to the steak or whatever have you that we forget that there are people that come in the church and if they walk out like they walk out, they walked in, they will die. Jesus recognized that they've been walking with him. And if they ever left his sight or space right now in the condition that they're in, they will never make it whole. God have mercy. 
This is what I'm trying to get us to be, a sensitive church to recognize that everybody that's walking in ain't walking in with nine lives. Some are walking in by the hair of their chinny chin chin, y'all, y'all. But some they need somebody to throw them a lifeline so that they can get healed. But our problem is we're still looking at the clock. Our bodies are in church, but our minds are back home on the television or on the golf course or wherever and folk are dying around you. But you're so caught up in you. Jesus had to tell the disciples, I can't send them away like this. Just let them go home. That's your answer? Let the people go home. That's your answer. Not recognizing that some of them are two steps away from giving up. Y'all, God have mercy. You don't understand. Yeah, folk look nice on your road. They look cute. They look sweet. But guess what? You don't understand that there's an inner wheel. There's an inner turmoil that's going on inside of them. They're struggling. That's trying to put the best foot forward. That's trying to put the smile on their face. But the truth of the matter is, I'm, wrong. I'm one moment. I'm one moment. Don't push me because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. That's how some people are in here. I'm just one thing away from losing my mind. That's why I don't come here to play church. I come here because there's a need for deliverance and breakthrough. People are hurting, but we're so caught up. I wish pastor hurry up. I'm tired. It's been a long week. It might have been a long week for you, but this might be the last week for somebody else. But you got the ability and the anointing on the inside of you to pull somebody out of that mess and that struggle if you would just get sensitive to the spirit. Folk hurting in your mind someplace else. Folk are discouraged and you thinking about what you got to do next week. And folk trying to figure out how to even get to next week. Look at your neighbor by them and say, I will not let you die on my watch. Y'all ain't saying I can mean it. Tell them I can mean it. I won't let you die on my watch. I got a destination that we got to get to and I'm not going to let you die. When you in the church, you on my watch. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me. It is crazy for me to think to let church out now because some folk want to go when you see the hurting people that just need one more praise, that just need one more worship, that just needs one more prayer. But we got selfish folk in the church. I don't know why they always up there. Well, baby, you don't know. They might have a lot of stuff that they're trying to get out. So instead of talking about them, won't you come and pray with them? I'm not going to holler and preach. I'm going to teach you today. You struggling. I don't know why they down there. But if you don't know why they down there, get in the spirit. I thought this was supposed to be a spirit led church, not a flesh led church. We got too much idle time. That we do, that's why we mess up. And that's why we do what we do. That's why we got people that can't last no longer than an hour or no longer than 20 minutes. And I'm not saying church is supposed to be all day. But doggone it, if God wants all day church, let me be there. Because if that's what he wants and that's what he desires, guess what? I'm going to be. I'm going to be right there. Co-pastor told me something. She said, ask the people this question. Would you still do it if you wasn't getting paid? Half of us wouldn't come to church if there was no it was no heaven or hell to gain. 
If you found out heaven wasn't real and hell wasn't real, you wouldn't come to church. Some of y'all only coming to church because you don't want to go to hell. But now to realize you about to bust hell wide open because you ain't doing nothing on this earth with what God gave into your hands. So your motive is wrong, so your salvation ain't right. God have mercy, y'all. Oh, see, that's your problem. Most of us got saved off the wrong reasons. You got saved because you don't want to go to hell. You shouldn't get saved because you don't want to go to hell. You should get saved because you recognize that Jesus loved me so much. However you start it, it's how you go end it. And if you start wrong, you go end wrong. Our motives are wrong. Like the disciples, you walking with Jesus, and the only thing you can say is, "Who? how can we fill them? How can we do this? We're in a place, watch this, we're in a place that produces nothing. You where we where we there is no corner store, there is no bar low, there is no food lion, there is no Jewish teeter. Where we go get this from? That's why you are believers. That's why you are kingdom minded people. Cause the God that we serve created something out of nothing. That's what you do. You take nothing and make something of it. I just got two dollars in my bank account. All I got is fifty cents in my bank account. Why are you struggling? Why are you there? Why are you there? You know why you there? Because you have allowed the enemy. Watch this to pose a suggestion that you now held as law. Okay. Okay. See, the enemy don't keep talking to you. He don't. How can he keep, how can he talk to you and talk to me and talk to them at the same time? He can't do it. Oh God, y'all, they can't. What he does is he plants a seed of suggestion. We water it. We feed it. And now we make the suggestion law. Well, let me help you understand something. Jesus didn't have anything, but he had the power to create what he wanted. How do you know, Pastor? The Bible says they needed money for taxes. And he looked around, and I'm sure he could have used a person, but he says, I'm going to use something that makes no sense. I'm going to use a fish. Yeah. I'm going to take a coin out the fish mouth. In other words, what God is trying to get us to understand is the places that you didn't think was going to bless you is going to be the place that's going to bless your life. Amen. 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 You're struggling. Watch this. We ain't got no wine, Jesus. No problem. What y'all got in here? We got some water. That's all I need. I don't need nothing else. Let me help you. Lord, I don't have the finances right now for gas. What you got? Faith. Okay, let me tell you testimony. Let me tell you testimony, Pastor. Years ago, long time ago, um, we, were, we were in between blessings. Far, far and in between. And so, and so, it was so bad, uh, Apostle, that we had to borrow my mother's Lincoln for a while. Because our car went down. We didn't have a one car at the time. And we had, no, two, we had two, but hers heard, but now we had, we needed to go two places. So my mother gave us the Lincoln. So we were going, we were coming, I was coming, coming to, to, uh, to church. And I had, I think, $10 in my pocket, Pastor Young. Had $10 in my pocket. 
and the light was on in the car. I ain't got gas no more. I got fumes. And as I'm driving this Lincoln now, y'all understand a Lincoln town car. And the Lord told me, as I'm driving, the Lord told me to go and give this to somebody. I can't make this up. I ain't lying to you. The Lord said, go give it to somebody. I said, okay, Lord. Sister Ashana, I went and gave it, right? I went and gave it. You know, I turned off the car. So, <laughs> so I wouldn't burn no gas, y'all. Yeah. Turn off the car. <laughs> Walked to the person house, gave them uh, where it was, it was. I can't remember that part. Wherever it was, I, I gave it to them. Gave them money. Got back in the car to start Shana. God, I'm say, I want to dance right now. Whew. Ashana, when I turn the car on, as God is my witness, apostle, the tank went from E to a quarter of a tank. Y'all too cute, boy. Y'all, they all is too cute. <laughs> because I didn't know what was going to happen. But God said, I don't need your money to put gas in your car. I'll breathe on the gas tank and make the gas needle go off. You ought to look at somebody and say, my God can do the impossible. Yeah. It went from E to quarter of a tank. More than one time. That's why I cannot understand how we can struggle when God has performed miracle after miracle after miracle in our life. Had a 1995 Ford Explorer, bro. This is how bad it was. I had to put it between drive and one for it to go forward. So bad till I almost felt like I was driving a stick shift because I had to let off the gas for it to go to the second gear. It was a 1995. I still had it till 2008. 2000, no, 2010. 2010. So at a 2010, nine, 95, 2010, right? That's how long I had it. I drove that car, that truck, from Charlotte to Charleston every weekend. But as I was driving it, I was speaking to it. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. I command you to live. I command you to keep going. I command transmission. You don't lock up. I command everything to happen right. I command you to lie. I command you going to get me to my destination and my destination back. That's the power that you're supposed to have because God gave you the power to break it, give thanks, and give it. Simon, I gotta get you, so you gotta live. Y'all, y'all ain't gonna preach to me, but brother. Can I tell you this? As a '95, I prayed on that car. Every part of the engine was still original when I got rid of it. Because I used the principles. I spoke to that transmission every day. And watch this now. It, now I wasn't being stupid, so I did go and get a check. I wasn't just being rambunctious. I went to get a check, but every time I went to get a check, the people say it's fine. No, it ain't fine. But all I recognized was the anointing was still on it. Y'all ain't understanding. You gonna go to your bank account and say, but I know I see five dollars fifty cents in here. They say but it don't matter, so you approve, cause the noise is gonna make that five look like five thousand. That's why you don't struggle, because your God will supply every need. You just got 
to trust him. You got to trust him enough that he'll do it. But he gave us the ability. Break it. Give thanks. Give. Let me get to the last part because I got to go. Y'all know I, I, I could preach this thing a long time, but I, I see some weary minds in this place. <laughs> but this is good to me because it's blessing me. So watch what happens. He give it to them. They go and disperse it amongst the people. Now, that is, that's cool. Okay? That's wonderful. That's great. Right? But watch this. What messed me up? What messed me up was this part. They got full. Y'all ain't catching it. Y'all ain't catching it. They got full. In other words, as long as there was a need, there was provision. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. See, our problem is you scared to talk. But where there is no provision, where there is no need, there is no provision. You got to give God a need so that there can be provision. You too prideful. Everything all right? I'm good. I'm fine. I'm good. Yeah, I'm. I'm I'm straight. You know. You know. I mean, I. I, I'm gonna get through it. You know. I just recognize. You know, some people. That's just how they are. You know. I just realize. You know. I mean. You know. It is what it is. (laughs) See, you don't. You. You ain't giving God a need. Instead of saying, God, you know what? Hold on. I recognize something. I still got some insecurity in my heart. You know, God, I recognize something. I still got hatred for my brother and my sister in my heart. I thought I was over, for real. I really thought I was good. But I just realized, ooh, that thing right there is still there. Mm, I need you to do something. See, our problem is we ain't being real. And I ain't talking about real with people. You ain't being real with yourself. Because now if you were real with yourself, you would recognize that, you know what, God? I got some stuff. And let me help you understand something. See, saying that don't mean nothing. Because everybody say that, but that's an out for some folk. That's just for, that's just for them to qualify why they act the way they act. But see, you don't need to qualify the way you act. If you really sincere about this thing, you will come to the awareness that there are some things in me that needs to be dealt with, and I need him to open up. I need him to do this. So, God, I'm opening it up to you. That's that breaking. 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 But most of us are not broken. We're probably cracked, but we ain't broken. God have mercy. And so crack don't mean you're broken. Because when you're broken, you can't put it back together. Has enough. He has. They get all this food, right? Everybody's eating. 4,000 people. But this is what messed me up in this. In that 4,000 is the twelve. In other words, what you give back to folk, you're going to be able to eat on yourself. The 4,000 included the 12 men that distributed the stuff. They gave what they had, but amongst everybody, everybody ate. It wasn't just one person. Can I help you understand what this means? That's the apostolic anointing. Because the Bible says that when they, when, when they came, they brought all things and laid it at the apostles' feet. And he distributed it, it amongst everyone. No one lacked. Can y'all imagine what would happen in this church if every one of us gave? Can you imagine what we could do in this community if everyone gave? Now, reel reel your carnal minds in and hear what I'm saying in the spirit. 
Imagine what this ministry would look like if everyone gave. Notice what happened. This is what happens. This is the power. They had seven baskets left over. God didn't just meet the need. He super exceeded it. But watch this. This is what blessed me. Jesus didn't take none of it. He ain't take a basket. He ain't take a morsel. Matter of fact, watch what he did. When he finished, he got in the boat. In other words, y'all ain't catching this like I'm. In other words, what he said is, I'm going to let you enjoy it. The increase that I'm about to put back in your life, I'm going to let you have it. <laughs> Not only are you going home full, but you ain't going home empty. Yo, I'm trying to testify to some folk in here today. You struggling, but God said, if you would give it, I promise you, I'm going to give it back to you so much and walk away from it. I'm going to let you enjoy it, and I'm going to have baskets left over for you to bless other people. Can you imagine what happened when these people went back to their homes with baskets full of food? Now the folk that were struggling this, that couldn't make it was getting it. Isn't it funny? Watch this. See, this is why you got to be careful. The disciples followed Jesus because he asked them. The crowd followed Jesus because they knew him. The crowd knew who Jesus was. Jesus told the disciples, come on, make, I'll make you fishes, fishes of men. Come follow me. I'll make you leader. I'll make you this here. He didn't say that to the crowd. The crowd just knew who he was. And watch this. The crowd wasn't following for anything. They just followed. It was Jesus who made, came to the, the light that they needed something. Can I help you understand something? The best way to get from God is not to ask, just be. Lord, I need this right here. Lord, I need you to do this right here. Lord, I need you to open this door. Lord, I need you to make this way. Lord, I need you to have this way. I need you to put this one. I need you to do this. A boogie, 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 boogie. Boogie, 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 boogie. That's what you're acting like. Y'all know what y'all do with kids and y'all try to get the kids to laugh? What you doing in there? Come on over here. Yeah, you got them. You're so cute. going all extra. Because what did he say? If you will delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you of your mouth. No, your mouth. In other words, if I praise him so much, I don't have to ask for it, he just do it. Y'all ain't going to talk to me. See, See, y'all, you, 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 you spend all the time, you spend the time that you should be worshiping and blessing him. You spend all of that time sitting here and trying to get him to do something. And God is saying, I don't need you to do that. Just be what I called you to be. Do it. You know what I did? I saw the need and I gave broken, gave thanks. I didn't do nothing else. I didn't pray to God, can we do this? Can we meet this need? Is this your will? Is this your desire? Is this what you want? Right, you want me to do this? Do you really want me to do it? Oh, let me get on full No, no, we Y'all spend too much time there. Then by the time you get up off the altar, you don't miss the moment. Wow, wow. But instead, Jesus said, What do you got? Bring it to me. Seven loaves, few fish. 
I'm going to open up this thing and I'm going to make it happen. I don't have to ask if this is my father's will because my father's will is that they be blessed. So let me help bless them. It ain't you got to ask, God, do I have to pay? Should I help get pay and get the mortgage? Should I help do this? You ain't got to do that. If you're a member, that's your responsibility. Then Jesus gets on the boat. Watch this. He goes now to the Pharisees. The Pharisees are frustrated because they're trying to do something in a religious setting that was done in a kingdom principle. Give me a sign. No, y'all got to understand this. If I can. They, they, they grabbing Jesus. We need a sign. We Give me a sign. This is what we want. Go read the scripture. They said he grabbed it. They were, they were being malicious. Can I tell you, that's what half of y'all doing with you. God, come on. I need you to do this right here. I need you to do this right here. Come on, show me. Show me. Show me. Show me, Jesus. Show me, Jesus. Can you please, if this is where I'm supposed to be, let me know. If this is what I'm supposed to be doing, let me know. Give us a sign. Jesus told them, go, 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 go on. He said to them, he's going from heaven for a sign. The next verse says what? Listen to what he says. Listen to what he says here. He says, and he sighed deeply in his spirit. He sighed. He was so hurt. He was so angry that the people that were supposed to be the religious folk of the year, of the place, needs a sign. Can I tell you that the frustration of the Lord kindles upon us when we need signs? Okay, what the Bible says, and these signs shall follow them. If it follows me, I don't see it. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me. Y'all gotta be, y'all gotta see the signs. You're supposed to let the signs follow you. That's right. That's the book. Give us a sign. If this is your will, give me a sign. If this is what you want me to do, give me a sign. If this is what you want me to be, give me a sign. Do you really want me to do it? Give me a sign. I need a sign from him because I don't know what to do. Y'all read why you don't know what to do. It's because you ain't broken. I can't preach this no better than this. Listen to what he says. He sighs deeply. Watch this, y'all. This is why you know this ain't, this ain't carnal. Because he doesn't sigh in his flesh. He sighs in his spirit. His spirit is grieved. The spirit of God is grieved when we don't flow like we're supposed to flow. The Spirit of God is grieved when we don't even know who we are. The Spirit of God is grieved when we don't even know what we're supposed to be doing. Wow. You in church this long and don't know what you're supposed to do? His Spirit was so grieved. Why does this generation seek after a sign? Why this church ain't supposed to be sign seekers? We're supposed to be the sign. But this generation is seeking after a sign. Watch what he says, y'all, because this is scary. Verily I say unto you, there shall be no sign given. No, he won't give you nothing. That's why people walk in aimlessly around because they're they waiting for signs. So because they have no sign, they don't know what to do. Anybody ever seen, I'm closing on this, anybody ever seen when the, the traffic light go out, right? It's the folk that don't understand the law that caused the accident. Because the common sense thing is you stop, one go, one go, one go, right? You don't need a sign for that. 
You just know. It's the folk that don't know that cause the accidents. This is why you got to be careful because you're going to come to a place where you ain't going to have a sign. Where you're not going to have a, 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 a yay I say. You ain't going to have a Moses burning bush experience. You're not going to have a fleece wet or fleece dry experience. You're not going to have uh, the wheel in the middle of the wheel experience. You got to know. That's why we struggle because we don't know. And so one day we know because of the sign. The next day we don't know because we don't see no sign. You got to know when there's no sign that I'm still walking in the will and the way of God. I don't care how hard it gets. I'm still in his will. I don't care how strong the winds blow. I'm still in his will. If you're looking for a sign, it will not come. Amen to that. Amen to that. Amen to that. Amen to that. Mm. When everything's good, I know what God is telling me to do. I know what he say do. When things are rough, I mean, I was doing it, but it ain't working now. How do you know it's not working? How do you know it's not working? Nothing tells you it's not working. Sometimes it has to wait. Sometimes, isn't it funny how a tree can be without blossoms the day and the next day, full of blossoms. Just because you don't see the blossoms today don't mean it's not blossoming. Watch this, y'all. Nothing grows during the day. Everything grows at night. Y'all are fussing. Because you're in your day but don't appreciate your nights. The nights is when everything starts blooming. When everything starts forming. But because we are so distraught. Because we don't know how to break ourselves before the Lord. Because we don't know how to relinquish our wills and our desires. Because let me tell you, because we live too much in this world, I can't say this enough. I guess this is always going to be my message. Mm -hmm. When you live so much in this world, you will never break beyond the crack. You will get a crack, but you will never get broken. Because you know what happens? You start breaking, and then you start, I don't want nobody to see this. Oh, let me pull this back in. Oh. I don't need to be acting like this. Yeah, you do. You need to be broken. God is looking for people that don't care how bad their mascara run. God is looking for people that don't care how bad you sweat out your suit. God is looking for people that don't care what you think about me when I'm getting my breakthrough. Why? Because when you get to that place right there, you don't care. The dude that Jesus spat on him didn't care. If that's going to heal me, spit away. But see, we can't do that because we got too much pride. And when there's pride, nothing flows, y'all. If it takes me to lay on this altar all day long, then guess what? I'm going to do it. I bet you if I told you if you stay here all day long, at the end of the day, I'll give you a million dollars. Ain't nobody leaving this church. I'm trying to tell you, we're wonderfully. Exactly. And if you start, and if you start sitting down, I say, if you sit down, you ain't going to get the money. You find a way to stand up. You will find a way to do it. Guess what? If I told you 5,000, you still do it. You see why? You know why? Because we are people that have to have incentive to do stuff. We have to have incentive to do it. Can I tell you what the incentive should be? The incentive should be this here. You may die in the next second. You can walk out of this church and go to your home and die just like that. You could take your last breath right now and drop dead in one of these chairs. 
there's no guarantee that you're going to live forever. There's no guarantee you're going to live tomorrow. There's no guarantee that you're going to live next week. But the real question for me is this right here. Is since you got the moment and opportunity to give God something and do something for him, why won't you do it? What are you going to stand and tell him when you stand before him? He said, why you didn't do that on the Sunday? Well, uh, 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 see, uh, what had happened was uh, uh, Sister Martha, you know, she ticked me off this morning. And so, you know, uh, you know, you know, uh, Pastor, he got on my nerve because, you know, he was preaching so long, you know. Uh, and so I, I, I just checked out. Well, since you checked out, I checked you out. See, I'm not trying to be elongation in, in church. That's not my point here. My point is this. Maximize your moments with him. You ought to maximize your prayer life at home. Maximize your prayer life during the day. Maximize your time with like-minded believers in church. Because you don't understand. You, you might be getting strength for something you don't even know that's about to come down the line. You don't know. You don't know what, to, what, this, what comes this week. You don't know what you're going to face this week. But if you gain the strength right now, if you get with the like-minded believers and saints and you rejoice, the stuff that you're doing now, you're, you're building something for later. You ain't building for the day. You're building for that. You might get in the accident, but the accident that should have killed you, it did not. Can I tell you something? Y'all don't understand. I'm telling you, that's why I can't let this stuff go. So I was driving down in Charleston, South Carolina. I'll never forget it. I was driving. And when I was driving, I was going going through the light and the person ran the light apostle she ran the light and right there the cobblestone on king street and that case there was a there's a building right there and when she hit my car she hit the car and i spun and there was you know the lift on, on the, to the sidewalk my car hit that and stopped and when i got out the car and looked around my cousin had a big old knot on his head and i was like oh lord and the police came there and when the police came they looked at it and the police said this to me apostle she says you ought to be grateful that there was a that the lift was here between the street and the sidewalk. She said, because had that not been there, your car would have flipped and went into the building. God have mercy. I'm trying to tell some folk that God may not keep you from the accident, but he will spare you in the accident. Stuff that should take your life, he won't let it take your life because you gave him something that will help you protect yourself during the week. Wow. You don't know your job next week might say you fired. You might get testimony that somebody close to you died. You might find out that you got some kind of cancer or some kind of disease or whatever it is. I don't know. But if I don't build myself up and do it when I get amongst the like-minded saints, where am I going to have strength when I deal, because let me help you understand, people, something that's going to happen in your life. It may not happen this week. It may not happen next week. But you better be sure that something will happen. What are you doing to prepare? Right. There's no preparation. So we find ourselves like the disciples. What can we do? No provision nowhere around here. What do you have? What do you have? What do you have? Stand up for all those things. If you understand that this is not a sermon under condemnation, but this is a sermon unto life. And honestly, there is so much that God wants to do with this house. There is so much that God wants to do with you. There are so many things that God wants to make happen in our life. But he can't do it until we're broken. Until we're willing to break it and give thanks to him. There are so many things in here. Don't lie. How many of you find yourself in the sermon today? Don't lie. Lift your hand if that's you. 
then if you found yourself, guess what? That means God loved you. He loved you enough for you to find an area now for you to get, get it right, to get that place right. I'm not calling an altar call, but I am calling for an altar call. You ain't got to come to the altar, but you should make the altar right where you are. Now, if you need to come to the altar, you're more than welcome. The altar is always open for anybody. But what I'm, what, what I'm more concerned of is that you find your altar. Because every time you have an altar to go to, you got to go to the altar in your heart. You got to go to a place where you can go and trust God. You ought to have a place deemed where you will, where it's you and God and God alone. Nothing else. So if you found yourself in this place and you need, and you saying, Pastor, I found me and I need to get this healed. I need to get this right. Don't be ashamed. Lift your hands high. And I don't need you to put them down. I don't care if your arms get tired. Speak to your arms. You're going you gonna to stand up here today. Because see, this is your surrender moment. This is your moment with him. You have to make yourself do something because you done, put, you done made yourself believe that you, that you can't. That you can't speak. That you can't say. That you can't operate like that. That's the devil. Yo, the Bible tells us to speak, to call those things that be not as though they were. Use our voice. Use your voice. That's what you do. You give, you give, you do a death to the enemy when your voice is being heard. You're giving death to the enemy when you use your voice to cast out the stuff that you've let to now infiltrate your heart and your mind. I'm only talking while you're talking. See, nobody's paying attention to you. They don't care. Really, I don't care what you got to say because it's between you and God. But you need to say it out your mouth. You to let the devil know that you will heal whatever it is. I command my mind to be strengthened again. Some of you have lost your vigor. Some of you have lost your, your hunger and your thirst for God. Your, 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 your discernment of him has been so desensitized and so your discernment of people is on but your discernment of him and yourself is not there. You need that again. You need to know about you. It ain't about nobody else. Jesus didn't deal with nobody else. He dealt with them as them. They were the ones that was he was talking to. So God is talking to you. He don't care about your neighbor next to you for your life. It's your life right now. So that your life is healed. They tell you on the aircraft, in case of loss of oxygen measure, uh, pressure, please secure your mask first. You can't help nobody on your row if you ain't healed yourself. So I need you to open up. Y'all quiet. I need you to speak. I'm just declaring with you.